All right, well, good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? Yes, I love teaching on Wednesday nights because you guys are way more awake than Sunday morning. <laughs> All right, well, we're glad you guys are here. I just want to challenge you tonight, you know, um, I, I love God's Word and how it's always uh, applicable to our lives regardless of what the chapter is, but I'm really excited about uh, the message tonight, and I believe that, you know, if we are willing to receive from God tonight, that I believe it, it's applicable to the body of Christ, but it also is applic applicable to your job. And I believe that if we would just be willing to receive tonight, there will be people here tonight that will work tomorrow with an attitude they've never had at work before. <laughs> Literally, like, <laughs> the excitement in the room just went... <laughs> Like, man, I came on the wrong night. All right, fine, fine. It's going to be like that, is it? All right. We'll get ready for the truth bomb because I'm throwing it in your lap then, apparently. So a quick recap before we, before we pray here. Quick recap. There was consequences to the, David's sin um, and that his family begins to unravel. Amnon raped his half-sister. Absalom murders Amnon for his actions, and Amnon flees to his grandfather for protection. And then David's given good advice to give him a way back, but we're going to see that he doesn't follow the advice entirely, but the advice was to bring him home. And so as we dive into this, we're going to be in 2 Samuel, and we're going to pick up where we left off in verse 23. So, Father, we thank you for tonight, God, but we thank you for the chance to dive into your word. And, Father, I thank you that we are so excited to learn how to be better employees tomorrow. And, um, Father, I just pray, Lord God, that you would just speak to us through your word. We thank you that your word is powerful and alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so tonight we say we are ready to receive. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so verse 23. Then Joab went to Geshur to, and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. But the king gave this order. Absalom may go to his own house, but he must never come into my presence. So already, you know, we, we saw this, uh, hey, we're going to give this, this, this advice was to open that, that pathway to come back to relationship. And so David's like, oh, yeah, yeah, takes the advice and immediately, like, does the exact opposite here. So Absalom did not see the king. Now Absalom was praised as the most handsome man in Israel. If you if you need to an example, do not look at me. Okay. <laughs> he was flawless from head to foot. He no, don't look at me. This is what I was trying to say here. He cut his hair only once a year, and then only because it was so heavy, when he weighed it out, it came to five pounds. So he had three sons and one daughter. His daughter's name was Tamar, and she was very beautiful. Absalom lived in Jerusalem for two years, but never got to see the king. So the whole purpose of bringing him there was for nothing. He, he hasn't seen his dad one, one minute. And so these comments about his looks may seem out of place, but they're really not. And so Absalom, he was, one, liked by the people. And two, he was praised by many as handsome and flawless. So liked and praised is your blank. His daughter was also very attractive. And so his daughter's named after his sister Tamar. But notice, his daughter is the only one named. And so it's believed that his three sons died at a young age. And the reason for this, we're going to jump ahead real quick to chapter 18. And it says in verse 18, during his lifetime, Absalom built a monument to himself in the king's valley. For he said, I have no son to carry my name. And he named the monument after himself. And it is known as Absalom's monument to this day. So his daughter is all he has. And and so he's liked, he's praised. But what's interesting is here is that Absalom isn't seeking the approval of people. He wants the approval of his father who is ignoring him. He gave him this pathway back, this way to build that relationship back. And now this is almost more punishment than being banished. 
And so verse 29, then Absalom sent for Joab to ask him to intercede for, intercede for him. But Joab refused to come, and Absalom sent for him a second time. But again, Joab refused to come. So it not only is the king ignoring him, but like literally like all the high official people are just ignoring him. And so Absalom said to his servants, go, set fire to Joab's barley field, because that's a great idea, and the field next to mine, uh, the field next to mine. So they set his field on fire as Absalom had commanded. Okay, so first of all, when you burn the fields of the commander of the armies, you literally fear nobody at this point. And his actions are reckless, and, and he's crying out for attention, like, somebody pay attention to me. So he sets all his fields on fire. But there's no repercussion of this, and in fact, there's no repercussion for anything. And if, Ab- if Absalom's actions were deserving of death, it is clear that after two years, the king was not going to do anything. And so his punishment is actually ignored isolation was what his punishment really was. Verse 31, Then Joab came to Absalom at his house and demanded, Why did your servants set my field on fire? And Absalom replied, Because I wanted to ask the king why he brought me back from Geshur if he didn't intend to see me. I might as well have stayed there. Let me see the king, and if he finds me guilty of anything, then let him kill me. Well, we already know he's guilty, okay? But we also know that he feels either, I mean, he could feel innocent, but I'll be honest with you, I think he feels safe from receiving any sort of correction or punishment in light of the fact that David failed to punish Amnon. Amnon. Like, literally, there is, like, he doesn't know how to punish his kids. And so, verse 33, so Joab told the king what Absalom had said. Then at last the king summoned Absalom to come and bow low before the king, and the king kissed him. And so he gets his wish, but not much comes from this meeting. And so if we pick it up here, the second consequences for David's sin, and it's going to be Absalom's rebellion. So this rebellion we're going to see here is, uh, is built on the foundation of number one, pride. pride. Pride is your blank. See, Absalom has a lack of remorse for his past sin, but I think, if anything, um, I don't think he believes there should be any consequences at all. I'm the king's son. The consequences don't apply to me. I'm above all of that. I'm the son of the king. And so the second thing is that Absalom is liked by the people. So what's interesting is, is that people who are popular and disgruntled cause the most damage. Because now they're the ones that have a following. And so, because they, and usually this is the case, and we're going to look at this tonight, usually they feel like they could lead better than those in leadership. And due to them being liked, people tend to agree. And so, 2 Samuel 15, verse 1, after this, Absalom brought a, bought a chariot and horses, and he hired 50 bodyguards to run ahead of him. And so, Absalom's creating a false sense of importance. Importance is your blank. For himself, and so he's appearing to be the son of the king, important in the eyes of the people. And Absalom is putting on a show for others to see. And to be honest with you, um, this is usually the case, especially in the body of Christ. Those that cause the most disunity appear to be important, but they're not in any form of leadership at all. I mean, I'm just being honest here. Think about your job. The people that cause the most problems and the most disunity, I bet you they're not managers at all. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Tough crowd tonight. You're, you're going to hate the rest of the sermon. I'm just going to let you know. <gasps> Woo! All right, okay. So the people saw Absalom as important. You know, he is the king's oldest son after all. And in Jeremiah 21, 12, it says, this is what the Lord says to the dynasty of David. Give justice each morning to the people you judge. So it was common practice during this time that there would be an allotted time each day, each morning, for the king to meet with people who had problems. So the king is your your blank there. It, It was part of his duties 
So you see here that it's possible, once again, that David is not in the place he's supposed to be. He's not fulfilling his duties. And so, verse 2, he got up early every morning, every morning, and he went out to the gate of the city. When people brought a case to the king for judgment, Absalom would ask where in Israel, where they, where in Israel they were from. And they would tell him their tribe, and Absalom would say, you've got, you've got a strong case here. It's too bad the king doesn't have anyone to hear it. I wish I were ju- the judge. Then everyone could bring their cases to me for judgment, and I would give them justice. So the rebellion is built upon a foundation of one, pride. And number two, lies and the seeds of disunity. Lies and disunity is your blank. See, Absalom is undermines the king by spreading lies about his leadership. Oh, it's a shame he doesn't have time for you. Now, it wasn't necessarily true. You know, I mean, David probably could have sat at the gate. But what, what he's doing is he, Absalom got to the people before the people could get to the king. And why would the king's son lie? It must be true. The second thing is Absalom determined, uh, undermines, Absalom undermines the king by suggesting that he could do the job better. And it was always for those, just for those, who had traveled a long way to get there. So he's creating this, this underlying thing that the king has time for those that live here, but not for you. He's creating this disunity within the nation. And so... And, and the people would be like, whoa, this is kind of an honor. Like, the royal prince is easily accessible right at the gate. How amazing is that? But a side note here is Absalom spreading these lies of disunity. And um, he's creating this appearance that the king only cares for those in the city. And so the craziest part is that, you know, you, you look at everything that Absalom is doing. And in all my years of ministry, I've seen these Exact things happen within the body of Christ more than I can count on my hands. But what usually happens is when leadership hears about it, they put a stop to it. And you have to ask, you know, how does David not hear about this? David must be like, man, the kingdom's going great. No one's come to me with any problems. And David has shown that with his children, he was naive to their true actions, and either he didn't believe it or he didn't want to confront it, one of the two. So verse 5, when the people tried to bow low before him, Absalom wouldn't let them. Instead, he took them by the hand and kissed them. Absalom did this with everyone who came to the king for judgment, and so he stole the hearts of all the people in Israel. And so rebellion was built upon a foundation of pride, lies, and the seeds of disunity. And number three, stealing the hearts of the people. Stealing the hearts of the people. See, Absalom stole their hearts away from the king. So you can't, you can't steal, uh, you can't steal the hearts away of people away from a church they love. You can't steal people away from a, a business or a, a, a boss that they love without first. There must be a seed of frustration that's sown. Oh, and this person's listening to me. And so, verse 7, after four years. That's a long time. You know, after like two weeks pastor's like holding me back like hold on a second i'm ready to deal with the problem now david let it go for four years other translations say 40 and it's believed that possibly the text is referring to absalom's age instead of amount of time passed it goes on it says absalom said to the king let me go to hebron to offer a sacrifice to the lord and fulfill a vow i made to him for while your servant was in Geshur in Aram, I promised a sacrifice to the Lord in Hebron if he would bring me back to Jerusalem. And so the rebellion was built upon a foundation of one pride, two lies and seeds of disunity, three stealing the hearts of the people, and four 
a disguise of being spiritual. Now, this is definitely the case within the church or the body of Christ. People who cause disunity within church always hide under this disguise that they are spiritually mature or they are spiritually the scholar in the topic. It's usually not the case because they don't ever come to me because nobody ever wants to debate with me about Scripture, and I, don't, I have no clue why. But let me put it another way. Those who bring disunity to any company disguise themselves as experts in that field. That's what they do. I don't know. They're pretty confident. Maybe they are pretty good. Maybe they would be a better boss. Maybe they're right. And so, verse 9, all right, the king told him, go and fulfill your vow. So Absalom went to Hebron, but while he was there, he sent a secret messengers to all the tribes of Israel to stir up a rebellion against the king. As soon as you hear the ram's horn, his message read, you are to say Absalom has been crowned king in Hebron. He took 200 men from Jerusalem with him as guests, but they knew nothing of his intentions. While Absalom was offering up sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel. That's right, I looked it up. <laughs> I just want to side note real quick. Pastor on Sunday was like, made a joke about me and saying names, and somebody was like, oh man, that's so mean. I'm like, you've heard me read names, right? And, and uh, so last week, Pastor was like, oh, we need an announcer at the football game. You should totally be the announcer. And I was like, boss, you've heard me read names, right? He's like, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it shouldn't be you. And with another first down for the Eagles. Yeah. The guy sitting next to me is like, his name's Smith. How do you mess that up? I don't know. I'm reading the names and I panicked, okay? Ahithophel, one of David's counselors who lived in Gil Gillow, soon... Many others also joined Absalom, and the conspiracy gained momentum. A messenger soon arrived in Jerusalem to tell David, all Israel has joined Absalom in a conspiracy against you. Okay, so Absalom took 200 men who were not against David to give the appearance, give the appearance that they were all in support of Absalom's succession to the throne. So this is, you know, cunning in actions, but what's interesting here, and, and, and hear me, apply this to every area of your life, that those that stayed silent only gave the rebellion momentum. When they realized what's going on, if, if they didn't say, whoa, 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 we're not a part of it, nobody said anything. And it built momentum. It's possible that the sacrifices were a part of cor a coronation ceremony instead of a fulfillment of a vow. So he's anointing himself as king here verse 14 then we must flee at once or it'll be too late david urged his men hurry if we get out of the city before absalom arrives both we and the city of jerusalem will be spared from disaster so david falls for the trick but also i i don't think david's afraid i think he just doesn't want to fight his son and we're going to see this in a later chapter that they're at war, and he's like, don't kill my son. He doesn't want to fight him. But also, he fears for the city. And what's interesting here, they could, they could defend themselves from war, but they, to defend yourself from civil war destroys everything. And so verse 15, we are with you, his advisors replied. Do what you think is best. So the king and all his household set out at once, and he left no one behind except for his ten concubines, which we'll talk about in a later chapter, to look after the uh, palace. The king and all his people set out on foot, pausing at the last house to let the king's men move past to lead the way. So those closest to David were loyal, and he stops at the last, last house to allow himself to see, all right, who's with me? Verse 18, there were 600 men from Gath who came, who had come with David along with the king's bodyguard. Then the king turned and said to Etai, a leader from the men of Gath, why are you coming with us? Go back to, the, to, to King Absalom, for you are a guest in Israel, a foreigner in exile. You arrived here only recently, and should I force you today to wander with us? 
I don't even know where we'll go. Go back and take your kinsmen with you, and may the Lord show you, you his unfailing love and faithfulness. But Etai said to the king, I vow by the Lord and by your own life that I will go wherever my Lord the king goes, no matter what happens, whether it means life or death. David replied, all right, come with us. So Etai and all his men and their families went along. So we're going to see here that as David's leaving in this situation, he's going to have five encounters. And so encounter number one is 600 men from Gath. These are men who are probably from, uh, they were probably Philistines, which is interesting to think about. That meaning the people who were once conquered were loyal to David. Loyal is the blank. They, 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 they couldn't possibly imagine being treated any better than they already were under his leadership. And so those who were new or guests to Israel wanted to stay with David. So these men represent those who recognize the good David had done. Good as your blank. David Guzik says, true loyalty isn't demonstrated until it's likely to cost something to be loyal. When, 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 when uh, rebellion arises, leadership finds out real quick who's loyal and who's not. And so the leader of 600 men from Gath Etai in the Hebrew means with me, with me is your blank. So these men remained loyal and were with David no matter what. Verse 23, everyone cried loudly as the king and his uh, followers passed by. They crossed the Kidron Valley and then went out towards the wilderness. Zadok and all the Levites also came along carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They set the, down the ark of God, and Abiathar offered sacrifices until everyone had passed out of the city. Not passed out. They passed out of the city. Then the king instructed Zadok to take the ark of God back to the city. If the Lord sees fit, David said, he will bring me, uh, bring me back to see the ark and, and the tabernacle again. But if he is through with me, then let him do what seems best for him. Okay, so encounter number two, the priests, the Levites, and, and the presence of God. And so the priests and the Levites were loyal to David. So no doubt, they, they were sensitive to the things of God, and they were aware of the wickedness uh, of, of Absalom. They were aware of that. Wickedness is your blank. See, these men represented those who recognized God's calling on David's life. And we're going to talk about this at the end, about, okay, outside of ministry, you have to recognize God's calling on people's life. And if all authority is placed there by God, what is God's calling on the life of those in leadership above you? And so David trusted in God, but not he, he didn't need the Ark of the Covenant. He trusted in God. And so... Um, his fate was in God's hand no matter where the ark was. He didn't want to make the same mistakes as the sons of Eli where they thought that the ark was going to protect them and then the ark fell into the hands of the enemy. And so he wasn't willing to, 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 like, um, he wasn't willing to risk the, the presence of God. Like, I, I'm not losing that. Like, send that back where it needs to be, and, and I trust in God that he's got me. And so the ark of the covenant sent back to Jerusalem and David is accepting what fate God has decided. This is a very different posture to that of Saul when Saul started to see things fall apart. And so, verse 27. The king also told Zadok the priest, Look, here's my plan. You and Abiathar should return quietly to the city with your son, Ahimeaz, and Abiathar's son, Jonathan, I will stop at the shallows of the Jordan River and wait there for a report from you. So Zadok and Abiathar took the ark of God back to the city and stayed there. Okay, so the priests, they're going to be the only ones that know the exact location of David, and David's going to kind of wait to see what happens. Verse 30, David walked up the road to the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and his feet were bare as a sign of mourning, and the people who were with him covered their heads and wept as they climbed the hill. Okay, so it's not a pity party. I think it's a lot of times we read the Old Testament, it seems like really dramatic. Like, man, they're so dramatic. But this, that's not what's happening here. Um, David is overwhelmed by the fact that he deserved this. 
and that the entire nation was going to experience the consequences of his family's dysfunction. Think about the heaviness of that. The entire nation was about to experience this. And so the significance of Mount Olives, uh, Mount Olives is in the Bible a lot. Uh, this being the first, making it the location for prayer. Prayer is the blank. Uh, the Garden of Gethsemane is located at the base of the Mount Olives. The night Jesus was betrayed, Jesus retraced the steps of David. And although um, both suffered for sin, Jesus suffered for the sins of the world, and David suffered for his own sins. It is Mount Olives is where Jesus ascended to heaven. And when Jesus returns, he'll set foot on Mount Olives and it will split it, creating a valley. And all of Israel will run to him and acknowledge him as Messiah. Verse 31. When someone told David that his advisor, Ahithophel, that's right, nailed it, was now backing Absalom, David prayed, Oh Lord, let Ahithophel give Absalom foolish advice. When David reached the summit of Mount Olives where people worshipped God, Hushai, Hushai, apparently this guy, okay. Hushai the archite was waiting for him there. Hushai had torn his clothes and put dirt on his head as a sign of mourning. But David told him, if you go with me, you will only be burdened. Uh, you'll only be a burden. Return to Jerusalem and, and tell Absalom, I will now be your advisor, O king, just as I was your father's advisor in the past. Then you can frustrate the counsel of Hithro, Ahithrophel, uh, uh, of Ahithrophel's advice. Zadok, Abiathar, the priest, will be there. Tell them about the plans being made in the king's palace. Then they will send their sons, Ahimeaz, and Jonathan to tell me what's going on. So David's friend, Hushai, returned to Jerusalem, getting there just as Absalom arrived. Okay, so Ahithrophel was David's advisor who probably was more concerned with his position in the royal court than really being loyal to David. And so encounter three, the third encounter was Hushai, the archite. Hushai meaning to come quickly, come quickly. See, where Ahithrophel, his advisor, had abandoned him, God quickly sent another that was loyal. And so his advisor had abandoned him. But Matthew 6, 8 says, your father knows exactly what you need before you ever ask him. And so Hushai represents those God sends to support us in times of need. Support is your blank. And so Hushai sent back to counter the advice of the other advisor. Chapter 16, verse 1, when David had gone a little beyond the summit of the Mount Olives, Ziba, the servant of Aphibosheth, was waiting there for him. He had two donkeys loaded with 200 loaves of bread, 100 clusters of raisins, and 100 bunches of summer fruit, and wineskin full of wine. What are these for, king, uh, the king asked Z Ziba. Ziba replied, the donkeys are for the king's people to ride on. And the bread and the summer fruit are for the young men to eat. The wine is for those who have become exhausted in the wilderness. So encounter number four, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth. I am killing it with these names tonight. Ziba brings help in a time of need. Now what's interesting here is the donkeys are to ride on to help them go further than you could ever go on your own. I'm going to say that again because I think you missed it. He literally gives them the ability to go further than they could ever go on their own. He gives them food, meeting the needs they have, wine for those who have become exhausted. Food and exhausted is your blank. Encouragement not to give up. See, Zeba represents those God sends to meet our needs in a time of need. Now, we're going to see here in a later chapter that Zeba actually is is kind of crafty here, but this is the interesting thing, is that God can use wicked people to bless his people. And so, and where's Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, the king asked. 
asked him. He stayed in Jerusalem, Ziba replied. He said, today I will get back the kingdom of my grandfather Saul. In that case, the king told Ziba, I give you everything Mephibosheth owns. I bow before you, Ziba replied. May I always be pleasing to you, my lord, the king. And so Mephibosheth is Saul's grandson who's crippled. And so we're going to find out in a later chapter that this report actually isn't true, that actually Mephibosheth sent him all this stuff, and he said, saddle my saddle, and he just left without him to take credit for it. And so verse 5, as King David came to Bahorim, a man came out of the village cursing them. It was Shimei, son of Gera, and from the same clan as Saul's family. He threw stones at the king and the king's officers and all the mighty warriors who surrounded him. Get out of here, you murderer, you scoundrel, he shouted at David. The Lord is paying you back for all the bloodshed in Saul's clan. You stole his throne, and now the Lord has given it to your son Absalom. At least you will taste some of your own medicine, for you are a murderer. Why should it, what, for you are a murderer. Why should a dead dog curse the Lord? Uh, my Lord, the king, said Abishai. So you had Hubishai, and he says, well, Abishai. Dad jokes, no? Okay. <laughs> Fired. <laughs> so who is this dead dog that will curse my Lord, the king, Ab- Abishai, son of Zeruiah, demanded? Let me go over and cut off his head. No, the king said, who asked your opinion, you sons of Zeruiah? If the Lord has told him to curse me, who are you to stop him? Then David said to Abishai and to all his servants, my own son is trying to kill me. Doesn't this relative of Saul have even more reason to do so? Leave him alone and let him curse me, for the Lord has told him to do it. And perhaps the Lord will see that I am being wronged and will bless me because of these curses today. So David and his men continued down the road, and Shimei kept pace with them on a nearby hillside, cursing and throwing stones and dirt at David. The king and all who were with him grew weary along the way, so they rested when they reached the Jordan River. And so David is humble in the fact that he accepts what is brought upon himself and that everything happening is a consequence to sin. Again, it's a totally different posture than that of Saul when things began to unravel for him. So the fifth encounter is Shimei. He represents those who hope for and celebrate when others fail. Believe it or not, this is usually the case. There's usually at least one that's always hoping for leadership to fail. See, whether you deserve it or not, I mean, it can be good leaders. People, people just want good leaders to fail. So rebellion, disunity, and disruption is always based upon, one, pride, two, lies and the seeds of disunity, three, an attempt to steal the hearts of the people, four, a disguise of being spiritual. And so I want to kind of close today, if, um, if we can, if I was going to play for me, we're going to take a minute here, and we're going to pray for our bosses. Yeah. Some of you guys are like, oh, dear God, no. But what has God called you to do in these situations? And so, number one, be the one to recognize the good in that leader. Good is the blank. You have to reject the, the seed of disunity and speak positive to counter the negative. This is what you need to do. See, Absalom made it look like the people were with him, but in fact, they were not. This is usually the case. I, I, people sometimes will come to me like, oh, man, so many people are upset about this. I'm like, oh, Really? Who? Oh, it's so many people. So you, got it. Yeah, cool. Number two, be the one to carry the vision and recognize God's calling. See, the Levites and the priests recognize the calling of God on, on David's life. They recognize the wickedness in those trying to cause disunity. 
And I want to tell you, don't get caught up in disunity. Stay true to the vision. Whether it be in the body of Christ or it be at your job. What is the mission statement of where you work? What is the purpose of your company? Stay true to that vision. Be the one who carries it. Number three, be the one who brings support to leadership. Support is your blank. You might be like, yeah, but you don't understand, Pastor Isaac. My boss is an idiot. Then be the one to make him better. Be the one who lifts him up. See, on the job or in ministry, whatever it is, be the one who lifts up leadership, not pulls it down. Number four, be the one who recognizes and meets the needs of those in leadership. Needs is your blank. You might be like, man, I, I struggle. I struggle with, with the managers or the boss or whatever you have in leadership above you. Above you. Be the one who meets their needs. about your job. What does your boss need? Second Samuel 16 and verse 9 it says, he said, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Abishai, son of Zeruiah, demanded. Let me go over and cut his head off. David's like, no. He has to, he has to like talk him down. Like, well, you're, you're good. You're good. I feel like I deserve what's happening, but I appreciate what you're doing right now. Number five, be quick to defend leadership instead of joining the rebellion. Be quick to defend it. We're going to see here in a, um, when we get to the portion of scripture where uh, a fibber chef comes, we're going to find out that there's two sides to the story. And usually the one that's the loudest is the usually the one that's wrong. Be quick to defend leadership. He says, let me defend you. And David says, no, this is not your job. Now, it doesn't just say this, but this is how I picture this whole scene going down. I picture all of his men with their shields up above their head and David in the middle and they're guarding him as they're walking because rocks are being thrown at them. And the question is, in your job, are you the one that holds up the shield to protect the things, the, 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 the disunity that's being thrown at your boss? I told you guys you're going to hate this sermon. Are you the one that's, that's the shield? So you got to ask yourself a question. If all authority is placed there by God, then what has God placed there, you there to do for that leadership? I, I remember when I, I was working in the oil field and uh, it was somebody from the church, Jason got me the job. And so the two of us from our church and, and my boss literally told me, you guys are the best two workers I got. So when it came time to hiring somebody, he was like, you got any more people from your church? No, I couldn't ever get, I invited him to church all the time because I, you know, uh, a couple times I got to preach and I would invite, I'm preaching this week, you want to come? See, your, your, your place of work, you may be the only Jesus they may ever see. I, I, when I was in the oil field, I had this crazy, I looked like Forrest Gump. I had like this crazy beard and long hair. We were looking at pictures this week about it. My boss used to call me Skinny Jesus. I literally was the only Jesus he may ever see. What has God placed you there for? You know, um, but to get back to the body of Christ for just one second, because I'm going to be honest with you. I know there's 
time is short. And the reason why I know time is short, because not only is the enemy attacking the things of God, but there is arising preachers attacking the things of God, attacking callings. Listen to one thing, and the guy said, stop listening to your pastor. Oh, you're going to come to Wellington and shepherd the people then? There's an attack on truth right now. And we have to be defenders of it. We have to go in the holes the shield up and says, no, we reject that. I loved it when I, uh, I did um, the discipleship class. There was a guy that had, uh, hadn't been to church maybe twice. Came in and, and while I was on stage, challenged the theology. <laughs> By the second week, literally, uh, the people in my discipleship class were like, don't worry, but we'll take care of this. And they basically told him, look, you wolf in sheep's clothing, get out of here. <laughs> they literally were holding up the shield. So I was like, okay, you guys got it, cool. Eric Selgren was one of them. Held up the shield so I didn't have to take the bricks to the face. What, do you, what has God placed you there for? See, your job is more than whatever you're putting your hand to. Your job is to be a light in that, in that place. To be a light in your neighborhood, to be a light in your community, to be a light in your profession. See, there is a fate for those who tear down leadership, but there's a blessing for those who hold it up. Fate and blessing is your blank. There's a fate for those who tear down leadership, but there's a blessing for those who hold it up. Maybe God has you exactly where he wants you to be. Yeah, but my, I don't work at a church. I don't care. But my boss isn't a Christian. I don't care. All authority is placed there by God. And he has placed you there. He has placed you there to, one, be the one to recognize the good. Number two, to carry the vision. Number three, to bring support to leadership. Number four, to meet the needs of those in leadership. And number five, to quickly defend leadership instead of joining the rebellion. What if God's people had a different attitude about how they approach the workspace? Because I'm going to tell you, revival in our nation isn't necessarily going to take place within the walls of a church. It's going to take place when God's people begin to answer the call. Pastor's vision, engage. It's time to meet the reason I am where I am. You may not like your job. You may not be there forever. But for that season you were there, answer the call for the reason you were there. Go and stand with me tonight. We're going to pray for our places of work tonight. So right where you are. Let's just begin to lift up our, our bosses. Begin to oh, like lift your voice up and pray for them. Pray for them by name. So Candace, go ahead and play for us, and we're going to pray for our bosses tonight.